This game is rated M and is intended for mature audiences. Hey there, Artie! A familiar ceiling. The smell of my bed of the bed and the pillows. I knew them well. Was this my room? Normally there wouldn't be anyone in my room besides me, but their presence made me spring wide awake. When did I get that pain shot through my entire body? Why well, don't like this? She's looking worried, but we also know she's psycho at this point. Why was Rena in my room? Blood began to surge through my muscles, uh, my capillaries. I can't even talk. It's too late for me to talk properly. But Rena's smile belonged to the Rena I knew well. I knew I shouldn't let myself feel this way, but I relaxed, thinking that this version of Rena was safe. My body had become more lethargic than I could have ever imagined. I guess that would uh, be, be the expected outcome after exerting everything I had back there. I tried to at least clear my head, but I just couldn't shake the sluggish feeling out of my mind. At least Rena called the doctor. That was nice. I wasn't injured seriously enough to merit calling a doctor. But knowing that someone impartial was coming was slightly reassuring. どうしてここにいるんだ。確か I talked about it, I finally remembered what happened right before I passed out. Recalling that memory and the terror that went along with it caused the fogginess around my head to clear right up. Let's forget about those two for now. I didn't expect Rena to be nursing me. I thought Rena was trying to kill me. She would have had the perfect chance while I was unconscious. Not only did she not kill me, she had nursed me back to health. Looking at Rena's delicate frame, it was hard to believe that she had not only gotten me back home, but dragged me all the way up to the second floor. Did she have some help? Rena appeared a bit surprised, but still kept her smile. What the heck is going on here? I don't even know what's real or not. I didn't remember. My memory was fuzzy after the point where I lost consciousness. What the heck is going on here? She said it bluntly. The way she stated it felt slightly unpleasant. It was I was just too timid at the time. I might have been able to force some answers out of Rena. But if I did that, then this kind Rena might transform into the scary Rena who I didn't know. Fearing that, I didn't press any fervor. Thinking about it, it was the obvious choice. If both of those men were there, I don't think Rena would have stood a chance. I couldn't find a way to explain it unless I assumed she brought me here after those two were already gone. Rena was still smiling. Her eyes sparkled warmly. Yet... I felt like I was hallucinating when I saw nothing. Something akin to a shadow slowly creeping across her face. That small omen sent shivers down my spine. While Rena was still Rena, I needed to make contact. I needed to contact Uisi-san. Rena stopped me when I tried to get out of bed. She said it would aggravate my wounds so I should sleep. <laughs> Rena couldn't say anything else. While Rena stayed in the room, I quickly went downstairs to get the phone receiver in the living room. When I approached the front door, the doorbell rang. Ding dong! It must have been the doctor Rena had called. It was strange for a patient to welcome in the doctor who was making a house call, but it would be incredibly reassuring to have him here for the considerate time it would take for Uisi-san to get here. 
I carelessly opened the door with the simple assumption and regretted it almost instantly. M Mion. Hi, Mion. You're not the doctor. Well, that was nice of you. But don't kill Luisi san when he gets here. I understood why she would call a doctor. But why me own two? Rena was descending the stairs behind me. Rena, Kei-chan, are you okay? You're worried about it. That's right. Rena was worried about it. They both began laughing. It appeared to be cheerful laughter, but I couldn't shake the feeling that there was a darkness looming over them. What? <laughs> oh, don't worry about it! <laughs> oh, don't worry about it! I think, I think we have uh, termites in the house. Yeah. The shoe rack that I had smashed to pieces had been like that since yesterday. Uh, I kept the fact that it was none of her business to myself. True. Aw, that's nice. Terminally ill? I'm not terminally ill. Unless that's a fret. Both of them urged me back up the stairs. I still need to use the bathroom. I had no cho chance to call Uisi-san. I was pushed into my bed. As it was the first time Mion had been in my room, she began searching around it intently. She fiddled around the room and was scolded by Rena. You can imagine how it went. It was uncomfortable having my room being poked around, but the conversation was so benign that it was heartwarming. During that innocent conversation, Mion said something as though it was perfectly ordinary. Rena. You called her first? Director? That out of place word gave me a bad feeling. Rena called a doctor. Then called Mion. And after that, she called a director? Who was this director? Since Rena and Mion's conversation was so peaceful, it only felt slightly odd. What? <laughs> oh, I don't like where this is going. I dug through all of my memories for a director who might have had business with me. Only one thing came to mind. What Rena had just said. The construction site foreman. The very first victim of the first incident. The dismemberment at the damn construction site. The foreman? But that was strange. He was supposed to be dead. There was no way they could call him. I asked one obvious question after another. But all the two of them did was smile coolly at each other. Well, I mean, they do look nice right here, but probably won't last. There was a huge difference between how the two of them appeared and how my suspicions were playing out. Also, oh, this is interesting. That's like a different perspective. Aw, that one actually looks really cute. It's too bad that I think they're both psycho, though. Or at the very least, Rena is. Uh, I think Mion is at the very least kind of malicious. Slowly, I feel discomfort and panic welling up inside me. I couldn't understand what Rena and Mion were talking about. Oh, yeah! They were not making sense. <laughs> this is getting very disturbing. Rena and Mion looked at each other and laughed haughtily. That disturbing cackle unpleasantly resounded around me. 
That laugh, long enough to be unsettling, ended abruptly. Her face was laughing, but Mion's eyes told a different story. <laughs> this is becoming a giant mind screw right now. Oh, yeah! I certainly did have that homework. But I had thrown away the rest of the mochi after I found out about that sewing needle. So I wasn't able to f answer which one Rena made. The penalty for that? Why now? <laughs> No doubt my question was written all over my face. Their answer to my question was that dry laughter. I could no longer make heads or tails of anything. Yeah, you're you're insane. You're insane right now. I began to think that this entire day was somehow insane. Strange. Incomprehensible. Being chased by Rena, attacked by strange men, the penalty Mion and Rena were talking about. <laughs> Their continuous creepy laughter. Wait, what? What were these two laughing at? It didn't take long to realize that I had been dragged into an abnormal situation. Who were these two? Who were these people? Who were these doppelgangers of Rena and Mion? Rena had gotten behind me at some point. Why was she pinning my arms behind my back? What? <laughs> I hate this. My body was already very sluggish, and Rena pinning my arms made it much harder to move. I seriously tried to struggle, but she wouldn't even budge. My panic began to well up, and I realized this was well beyond the realm of jokes and pleasantries. The freakish monstrous strength. It would have been impossible for the Rena that I knew. Then... These thin, frail arms grasping me firmly. Whose arms were they? Mion? No, that thing that looked like Mion spoke to me like how Mion would speak to me. But I was certain that this was not Mion. Someone who wasn't Mion. Someone who was just pretending to be Mion. <laughs> Mion fished through her pockets and pulled out something bizarre. I could tell what it was just by looking, but for such a thing to be in her pocket, my mind would not accept it. It was a small... Syringe. Oh, farts! It was a small, clear syringe, a kind the doctor might use if you want to went to them with a high fever. Rena held me even tighter, and I could hear that clattering laughter that no longer sounded like laughter blaring into my ear. That eerie laughter. It wasn't something the Rena I knew could ever produce from her own throat. This thing that was pretending to be Rena, was this their real laugh? Unable to defend myself, the syringe Mion was holding drew closer, and that needle tip was waved in front of my face countless times. You're not injecting anything into my blood. さっぱりわからねえよ。知ってるくせに今さらかまととぶられてもな。わけのわからないことを言って、俺を煙にまくのはやめろ。No freaking way. Holy fudge. The same as Tomotake-san. I didn't really understand what she meant. What did that have to do with this syringe? 
You guys couldn't have been the ones responsible, though. Rena whispered into my ear, laughing as if to admonish me. Okay, these literally must be like demons pretending to be them. But even the way she spoke was repulsive beyond compare. Plain dumb? Me? About what? What do you mean, the same as Tomatake-san? みんな始めは引き逃げされたものだと思っていました。ですが、意識を確かめるために近づいた景観はすぐに異常に気づきました。喉がね、引き裂かれていたんですよ。な、ナイフとか？うん、爪でした。Nails? Nails as in fingernails? With those gouged through? That's right. Tomotake-san had clawed out his own throat with his own nails and died. There's no way someone could die like that! So then for that to happen... That's right. The police didn't find any drugs in Tomotake-san's system. <laughs> the two of them laughed together with sickening laughter. Of course they'd laugh. To assume that such a medicine didn't exist just because the police didn't know about it was completely foolish. Meaning, the drug that caused Tomotake-san to die in such a bizarre manner did exist? If Mio injected this into me, then that would probably be all the proof I needed. That would basically mean I'd end up the same as Tomotake-san. Become hysterical, scratching out my own throat in my last moments, then die. For such an outrageous drug to exist. For Mion to be holding it. And that I was about to be injected with it. At that moment, I did not feel any need whatsoever to question it. What kind of idiot, when he's trying to dodge a ball flying straight to his face, has time to think of a reason as to why it's flying at him. Mion's actions lacked any gravitas, and that made it all the more terrifying. This was none of the ceremony, like when someone is sentenced to death. There was no hesitation at all, as if she were brushing her teeth. Mion reached out with one hand and grabbed it onto my chest. It felt like electricity had run through the back of my head, and the entire world had gone dark. Did I stand up too fast? Or did someone hit me really hard in the back of the head? Having lost my sense of balance, I was assaulted by a wave of dizziness. What the cuss is going on? I squatted down for a bit. When I came back to my senses, my entire room had changed drastically. The numbness in my head was gone, and slowly, I could tell blood was flowing, flowing to my extremities again. How long had I been squatting here? How many minutes? Or has it been hours? It was almost as if the hands on the clock had stopped moving the entire time my eyes were closed. That's how little time passed. Really? The air in the room wasn't even filled with that madness from before, only a dull silence. Rena wasn't there pinning my arms, and Mion wasn't there about to inject me with a needle. No way. Could it be? All of it? Was a hallucination? There was no other presence in the room up besides my own. It was the weirdest experience I'd ever had. I was certainly with Rena and Mion. I doubted my sanity for a moment, but... I was almost also seized with some sort of comfort. <laughs> I guess that terrible ordeal was a hallucination. Neither Rena nor Mion. They wouldn't ever do something so terrible. My head grew hot. I could tell my emotions were welling up. Why? That wasn't a reason to cry. Why? It was sorrow. Why was I sad? I don't understand. I don't understand. Kind to everyone, not discriminating against age or gender. Mion. 
that Mion was sprawled by the window in an unnatural pose. Blood stained her a deep red from her head down to her chest. What? The bright crimson smeared on the walls. That splatter had undoubtedly come from Mion. She always had that bright smile and was kind to me from the day I transferred. Rena. That same Rena was slumped at my feet and making the same pool of blood as Mion. I couldn't comprehend what had happened. Did someone come to save me? Then they beat these two down with this metal bat? I finally noticed the weight in my right hand. How long had it been there? It was Satoshi's metal bat. It was covered in a deep red. There was no doubt that this was the weapon used to mutilate both of them. And I was holding that weapon. I was the only person in the house. Uh, what? What? Uh, I just... I don't know what's happening, but apparently we killed them? I, I literally don't know what's real anymore. This... Ke Keiichi has gone completely insane. I don't know what's real anymore. Looking at this objectively, I couldn't think of anyone other than myself who could have done it. That's right. Keiichi Maibara. Of course I did it. I told myself gently, as if coaxing myself. Hey, me. There is no reason for you to remember it, nor is there a need to regret it. Eat or be eaten. You get that, don't you? Neither Rena nor Mion had moved an inch. It wasn't just a split forehead and a trickle of blood. Nothing that simple. The entire room was splattered with red, and it told me it didn't end with just two or three strikes. The depths of my mind were calm, but on the surface I was panicking and agitated. Calm down, Keiichi Maibara. What happened to your unusual calm self? Come on now. Do like you always do. Pour your head back and take a deep breath. Come on. Once. Twice. Breathe deeply. Calm down. Calm down. I chanted that over and over in my head and relaxed. Color came back to my vision and smells re-infused re the air. At the same time, I remembered what happened when I blacked out. Rena and Mion had attacked me. They were about to inject me with whatever caused the same symptoms as Tomotake-san. But right before that happened, I fought back. I twisted my whole body and threw Rena as she was pinning my arms. Then I followed through with my spin and slammed my foot as hard as I could into Mion's torso. It was soft. Rena tried jumping on me, so I tackled her as hard as I could and slammed her against the wall. I didn't let that brief moment of having them off balance slip by. Satoshi's bat was left carelessly by the side of the desk. We... At that moment, everything went pitch black. There was nothing recorded past this point in the videotape of my mind. No. That wasn't right. It wasn't that there was nothing recorded. It was recorded just fine. Just... The other me inside myself had told me not to look at it and had turned off the TV. Just because the screen had gone black and I couldn't see it, didn't mean the videotape within me hadn't recorded it. The TV was just off. The video was still playing. The tape within me, creaking along, still playing. On the other end of that pitch black screen, that horrifying video was still playing on. Compared to this, though, this, the scene right before my eyes, was still so difficult to take in. There was blood splattered everywhere on the walls, and the two of them were in these unnatural poses. I'm surprised they didn't give us a CG of that. Maybe they thought it would be too violent, but I mean, it is a horror game. It is rated M. Not a sign of movement from them. I couldn't even tell if they were breathing. No matter what the circumstances were, my friends, these girls, I had... I had attacked them. I may have even killed them. But if I hadn't done this, then I would have been the one done for. Balancing that out on the imaginary scale, it felt odd that I'd even feel bad about it. 
Even if it was a bit excessive, this was justifiable self-defense. The proof was all there. The two of them collapsed here in Mion's syringe. Mion's syringe filled with some unknown dra drug would certainly solve the mystery surrounding the incident with Tomotake-san. And from the fact that both of these two were involved, they'd be able to pick out the criminals one after the other. Still, I might be suspected for this. But that was just fine. Anyway, now should this should be a police affair. This wouldn't fall into darkness like Rena's past incidents. As long as the police were involved, that should bring this to a close. They'll probably revisit their investigation on the chain of incidents. Uisi-san would definitely get to the bottom of it. Meaning, my wish of not wanting to die, of wanting to know the truth, that would be fulfilled in its most basic form. It was all a matter of time now. The doctor Rena called should be getting here soon. I'll confess everything to him. I needed to contact Uisi-san. At that moment, I remembered. Besides the doctor, a director had been called. It was easy to imagine that they were someone deeply involved with the incidents, judging from Rena and Mion's conversation. The ache in my chest, caused by the gruesome deed I'd done, dissipated rapidly. It was not over yet. This place was no longer safe. Stay calm, Keiji Maibara. It's not over yet. I needed to live long enough to tell the police about this incident. At that moment, I felt like I heard someone's voice from outside. Since people were speaking, it must mean that it was more than one person. I moved the curtain ever so slightly and peered outside. It was a bizarre sight. About four or five grown men were all gathered at the gate. They very much resembled the two men who had assaulted me at the dam site today. Those two might even be among them. There was one person there wearing a white coat. But he didn't look like a doctor at all. My gut told me he was in disguise, only posing as a doctor. That guy would probably ring the bell and get me to open the front door. Pretend to be a doctor to get me to open the door, and then the rest of them would all rush in at once. At that moment I saw a car parked behind the men, and my heart had nearly skipped a beat. The WHITE VAN! No mistaking it. That van, the one that had tried to run me down, the man in the white coat entered the gate and headed towards the front door. The rest of the men hid in the bushes and watched him. I probably couldn't pretend that I wasn't home. Undoubtedly, they just break the window and enter. I needed to get out of here somehow. Then, use a public phone to contact Uisi-san. Then meet up somewhere. First of all, I need a weapon. Then shoes! But before all of that, there was one thing that I had to do. I had no intention of dying. I'd live, and reveal the truth about the nonsensical cure curse of Oyashira-sama. But what would happen from here on, regardless of how determined I was, may bring about my demise. And that was why. There was one thing more than getting out of here right now. I need to get that clock out quickly and take the note hidden behind it. Damn it! The tape was sticking to it fast! It'd be fine if it was torn a little. I opened up the slightly torn note and began writing another passage alone with a ballpoint pen. If I wasn't able to inform Uisi-san, then the only thing I could rely on was this note. I'd never thought a piece of torn college-ruled notebook paper could be this reliable before. I had no time. I'd only write what I knew right now. I only needed to leave some sort of information that would lead them to uncover the truth. Rena and Mion are conspirators of the perpetrators. This was an undeniable fact. I still didn't want to believe it, but it was a fact. Anyways, I'd come. I'd leave all the information that would help them lead them to catching the perpetrators. There are four or five adults, maybe more. They have a white van. This was everything I was able to see from the window. There may be more. Also, there was that unidentified person known as the director. To begin with, the term director didn't even mesh with Hinamizawa at all. If they were going to include the directors from the past incidents, then the only one is the construction foreman, the victim from the first murder. The very first victim in the chain of incidents. Killed in a lynching, his body divided into six parts. His right arm was never discovered. The police should have confirmed that death. But Rena and Mion did both call him Director. They said Director. They wouldn't use that term to refer to someone who is dead. 
The police would never even conceive that someone who was deceased could be involved. Could that be some sort of oversight? I didn't know. But even if I didn't know, it could be a big hint for Uisi-san. That's right. They needed to start fresh from the first incident. It wasn't just a simple dismemberment, but the start of this stream of mysterious deaths that would follow. So then, there must be something hidden there. Please reinvestigate the victim from the dismemberment incident. He's alive. His death should have been established after an autopsy. Logically, you would think as much. But was that really the case? Could it have been some sort of ploy that they were able to deceive the police with? I shouldn't jump to conclusions, but he may still be alive. I had no time to ponder that right now. Oh yeah, there's something even more important that I needed to write. Tomotake-san's death was from an unknown drug. That's right, that drug. It was an irreplaceable piece of evidence. No doubt, just by having this, everything would be uncovered. I couldn't just leave that vital clue lying on the floor. This syringe is proof. Writing that down, I stuck the syringe onto the back of the cloth with plenty of tape. So it absolutely would not slip out and fall onto the floor. Firmly. Firmly! The bell rang. They were here! I couldn't write anymore. But even still, there was one last thing I had to write. I have no idea why it became like this. This may be the closest thing to the truth out of everything that I wrote on the note. If you are reading this, then I am probably already dead. Though you may or may not find my body. If I was going to write out everything that could happen, either dying from the curse or being demoned away, you who are reading this, please uncover the truth. That is my only desire. With this, my last will and testament was complete. It wasn't certain that I was going to die, but... It was my final plea, just in case. I folded the note, stuck it to the back of the clock, and then returned the clock to its usual spot. I couldn't help but pray. Uisi-san, if something happens to me, I leave the rest to you. After that, I gazed down silently at Rena and Mion. This was probably the last time we'd ever see each other. Rena, Mion. <laughs> I don't know if those were the real Rena and Mion, and if so, like, jeez, they were crazy. And I don't know how things are working out here, but... Why did it end up like this? I never had any fun in my previous school. I only worried about standardized test scores, about if the school I hoped to get into was really... where I really wanted to go, or a safety net. That was all I talked about. It was a dull life. The people I called friends were also my rivals in studying, in competitions, in personal records, and standardized test scores. Everyone here taught me how unhealthy that lifestyle was. This month was really fun. Making a fuss over lunch, making a fuss over the club, making a fuss over the festival. Something hot began dripping down my face. Uncontrollable. Tears. I should have had no obligation to shed tears for them. But they wouldn't stop even if they were after my life, even if they were trying to kill me. Everything that happened this month, I wouldn't forget it. Or could it be those happy days were all a facade as well? Was it all a trap, meticulously orchestrated up until today to ensnare me? Could it have been that I had just arbitrarily assumed that they were my friends? That couldn't have been the case! Both Rena and Mion, they really were my friends! Those happy days. There was nothing fake or unclear about them. Someone probably forced them to try to kill me. Or their minds were taken over, possessed by the supernatural entity known as Oyashiro-sama. Regardless, both Rena and Mion, they were, they were the best friends ever. And when they were coming after me, it wasn't of their own volition. But they weren't the kind of people to seal off their own friends, to sell off their own friends, no matter what. What means were employed to force them? There was no way such a thing as being possessed by Orochiro-sama could have happened in reality. Then, did the real Renan and Mion come after me? What was I thinking? What a silly, dumb idea. Having beaten down both Rena and Mion, I was still debating if they were the real ones or the fakes. There was no real or fake, only the reality that was before me. Rena and Mion were sprawled out at my feet. That was the only truth. I was only trying. 
trying to twist the facts to my benefit. That I had beaten my friends to death. No matter how I spun it, it wouldn't change reality. Rena and Mion were both dead. It felt like there was a crack in the dam of strange emotions I was holding back. It felt like my calm state, which was nothing more than a bluff, had receded. And in that opening, insanity was leaking out. I killed them. I killed them. Rena and Mion. I killed them. The doorbell rang again. The unrelenting echo pulled me back into a state of composure once again. I didn't have a moment to spare. Quickly, I needed to get away. I didn't want to die. I would uncover everything after that. The identity of whoever or whatever had pushed me this far. Even if I had to drink mud and eat grass, I would survive. I would survive. I would definitely survive! I killed Rena for that very reason. I also killed Mion. I went that far just to keep living. So I can't die. For my sake and for the sake of the late Rena and Mion, I have to survive! I ran down towards the door and grabbed my shoes. The doorbell rang again as if to urge me on. Behind this single solitary door, they were there. Keeping quiet, I headed towards the kitchen. Headed towards the back door. Before opening the back door, I put my ear to it and checked for people outside. No one? After I put on my shoes, I opened the door slowly so as not to make a sound. A piercing voice echoed out. That voice stabbed through me, setting my hair on end. I had to run! Get out of your cage, she! One after the other, I felt stuff like the rationale and intelligence. Those fiends you use when you have time to spare spill out of me. I didn't feel any pain from the branches stretch, just scratching my arms and forehead. My autonomously pulsing heart felt neither fatigue nor pain. My, ent my entire being just wanted to live. There was nothing else it desired. It probably had no complaints whatsoever. So of course I wouldn't feel fatigue. I just ran. Just recklessly rushing in the direction I was already heading. Even if nobody was chasing me, I'd still be running like this. There wasn't a thought in my mind where I headed. Turning around, I felt a presence right next to me. That presence was, without a doubt, chasing me like my shadow. If I took even one misstep, I would be devoured. That's what I thought. So I didn't turn around. I didn't stop. I ran. At full speed. Is there a payphone in Hinamizawa to call Luisi from? That was the chirping of the Higarashi telling me it was evening, trying to tell me something, and I finally heard it. The wailing cry of the victims who didn't make it. Would I be joining them? Only the Higarashi knew. They knew everything. They definitely knew. So, I ran towards where I could hear more of the Higarashi's chirps. But the fervor I ran, the fervor away the chirping became. I couldn't get near them. Why are you all running away? Was it my fault? Was I the one to blame? Then I'll apologize! I'm sorry. 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 I felt that only the Higarashi knew. So, like, is this going to be over yet? Come on, we're at 2.30 a.m. I have been streaming this for about six hours now. No, I've been streaming this for like six and a half hours now. Achievement unlocked. Chased by shadows. It's still not freaking over. The smoking room was filled with a cloud of cigarette smoke. The expensive smoke filter gave off some crackling electronic noise, but it didn't seem like it was doing anything at all. Why do smokers have to be, have, have to be shoved so far down this corridor where the sun didn't even reach? I recalled hearing that tax revenue from tobacco was about a tenth of the municipality's revenue. We, uh, we were the most heavily taxed members of this municipality, so I really wish that they'd show us a little more respect. Who the heck are you? Kuma guy. 
One of the younger detectives was having a staring contest with the Mijon magazine called Next Turn. The kid let out another groan, put out his cigarette, and then took out another one. Just then I heard a voice coming from down the hall. The man sitting in the seat Oisi san was heading towards waved at the telephone receiver. From the tone my Barakun's voice, I already knew he was in a predicament. This was the first time my Barakun had phoned me, and he was calling from a payphone. His voice was erratic over the line, and he had completely lost his sense of composure. After checking that nobody else could hear, I prompted him in a hushed tone. His voice was quivering and hoarse. He wasn't surrounded by people, even as he was making this call, was he? There was no other sounds besides my Barakun's voice. It had to be a phone booth. I scratched out a note and thrust it at my colleague sitting across from me. Hinamizawa, phone booth. He understood quickly and hastily started on the internal lines. It was best practice to avoid flustering someone panicking, but this was an urgent case. My Barakun didn't just get in trouble, get away, and then call me. He was in the midst of something dangerous right now. But yelling at my Barakun right now might just needlessly cause him to become even more frantic. My Barakun wasn't just calling to seek help. He was trying to tell us something more than that. And whatever that was, if I didn't get it from this call, I was certain there would never be another chance. My colleague pushed a note in front of me. There's only one booth in Hinamizawa. A patrol car is on the way. Five minutes. Not enough. If it was as I imagined, there would likely be quite a few people surrounding my Barakun. Five minutes was too long. There was something wrong with my barracoon. This wasn't a normal coughing sound. Vomiting? Or was it blood? Had he already been attacked? Was he injured? My I couldn't hear the other end of the line uh, that he was having a coughing fit on. Or you, I could. The worst possible situation popped into my head. I couldn't tell if that was a cough or vomiting. I 
ったけどやっぱり<笑> It was another intense bout of coughing then vomiting やっぱりおやしろさまってのはいやい今前原さんどうかどうか落ち着いてなんかさっきからおかしいと思ってたんですずっとつけてくるんですよ走っても走っても走っても走っても影みたいにぴったりくっついてだけども少しずつ少しずつ俺の背中ににじり寄ってくるんです前原さんそいつは今ひょっとして前原さんの後ろに後ろにすぐ後ろにお願いです前原さん怖いのはわかりますですがお願いですあなたの後ろに誰がいるんです振り向けるわけないじゃないですか振り向いたら俺俺怖いのはわかりますでも教えてほしいちょっと振り返るだけでいいんです前原さんの後ろに誰がいるんです Right after I said that I could hear him vomiting intensely What followed was a nightmarish sound 前原さんあんたまさか喉をひっかいてたりはしないでしょうね There was no answer But I could hear something like scratching There was a bang as if someone was being hit My Barakun had probably dropped the receiver. I could hear groaning and vomiting on the other end, and a repeating abnormal noise. I knew how far away my voice would sound on the other end, but I couldn't help but shout. At that moment, I heard whispering coming from the other end. I couldn't tell what he was saying. From the way he was saying it, he was talking to himself? Or was he talking to someone there? Son? Rather than whispering, there was some kind of a mantra he was chanting over and over. I focused my senses, trying to pick up what he was saying. What was he repeating? What exactly? Beep. Suddenly the line went dead. Did he use up his time? It was because he was a payphone. <gasps> It was because it cut out so abruptly. The last thing he said came so clearly in my mind. おいさん、車を消すおいさんごめんなさいがおいさん That's what he was repeating over and over. He said, I'm sorry. I had a gut feeling. There was no longer a need to hurry. I could hear the chirp of the Higarashi spilling in from the open window. I should have been able to hear them this entire time. I just wasn't paying any attention. Why did I focus on them all of a sudden? Were they trying to tell me something? Only the Higarashi knew. That's how I felt. June 1983. In Hinemizawa, a remote village near Shishibone City, there was a murder involving two female students. The suspect is Keiji Maibara, aged 15, apparently. The suspect called over his two female classmates, Rena Ryugu, Mio, and Sonazaki, to his house and beat them to death with a metal bat. That's not what happened. At least, not from what we saw. The scene of the crime was the suspect's room on the second floor of his house. The inside of the room was covered with a significant quantity of splattered blood, and there were signs of a struggle with the victims. In addition to the scene of the crime, the entryway, living room, and kitchen all had traces of a struggle. At the entryway, the shoe rack and wall had evidence of being impacted by a strong blunt force. It is believed to have been the same bat as the murder weapon. Having no traces of blood, it is believed the destruction occurred before the murders. There is the possibility that the suspect overpowered the victims to keep them from fleeing. In the living room, the rug had been pulled back and then thrown aside. It is hard to believe that a connection to, to, with, to the struggle with the victims, and thus the reason for this, remains unknown. In the kitchen, the garbage bag was torn apart and its contents spread out on the floor. Garbage was strewn about in the surrounding area, and the handprint believed to belong to the suspect were discovered. 
It is believed that the suspect had some reason for taking out the garbage and struck it with his fist. This is going to be a tough Ace Attorney case to figure out. The reason for this remains unknown. In addition, there was a note stuck to the fridge. The words, was there a needle, were written on it. The meaning behind this remains unclear. Just in case, the garbage was searched, but a needle was not discovered. Though the garage door was functional, it had been left open ever since the suspect moved in. The garage door was found closed. The suspect's fingerprints were discovered on the garage door. The reason behind this remains unknown. The suspect fled the scene of the crime. However, a patrolling officer, Hinamizawa Local Police Department, found the suspect collapsed inside of a phone booth. At the time of discovery, the suspect was unconscious in critical condition. He was rushed to the local hospital for treatment, but did not regain consciousness and died 24 hours later. What? The main character died? This is only chapter one! The results of the autopsy indicate the immediate cause of death to have been hypovolemic shock. It was determined that the suspect had clawed out his own throat and with his fingernails, and the resulting bleeding caused his death. What the crap is going on? With the similarity to the death of Tomotake-san the prior week, the police believe there is a connection and have opened an investigation. However, due to the wishes of the local authorities, it will be a confidential investigation. Due to the abnormal nature of the death, it was suspected that drugs were involved, but as with Tomotake-san, no traces were discovered. What prompted all of this remains inexplicable. As such, this case is being treated as an act committed on impulse. However, with several accounts of the suspect's bizarre behavior leading up to the incident, it is possible that this was premeditated. Separated from his group of friends, isolation, inexplicable behavior. Several days before the incident, the suspect began carrying around a metal bat. The suspect was observed displaying aggressive behavior as well as talk taking, talking to himself at school. His classmates have actually heard portions of what he was saying. Two days before the incident, the suspect declared to his parents his possi the possibility of his death. Due to these circumstances, the police have begun an investigation on the possibility that this crime was not committed on impulse, but was instead planned several days in advance. Afterwards, a note was found in the suspect's room that he had written himself. The note was written on two sheets of a B5 college rule notebook that had been each been torn in half. And as if trying to conceal it, it was stuck in the, uh, hidden behind a clock on the wall. The contents are written in the appendix. The police believe it to be strongly related to the incident. The police change their line of investigation based on the possibility that the suspect was involved in some sort of incident himself. However, no further clues were found, casting doubt on the credibility of the note. Was the crime impulsive or premeditated? With the, with the situation unclear and no further developments, the case has been labeled as unresolved. However, the following year, suspicion arose regarding the nature of the note. The note was not written on two halves of a B5 paper from two separate sheets, but was originally a single sheet of B5 paper. In order to erase several lines from the middle, someone had torn them out. Judging from the size of the letters, the missing section is estimated to be two to three lines. It is highly probable that the person who eliminated the lines in question is not the suspect. In addition, judging from the traces of large quantities of cellophane tape being unstuck to the back of the clock, speculation is that something other than the note was stuck here has arisen. The person who first discovered the crime was a detective rumored to have a connection to this incident, Karudo Uisi. He underwent a voluntary questioning, but denies involvement in any damages to the note. Interesting. So the syringe and the note about the syringe were removed. The suspect's note, I, Keiji Maibara, am in fear of my life. I do not know why they are after my life. The only thing I do know is that it has to do with Oyashiro-sama's curse. Rena and Mion are conspirators of the perpetrators. There are four or five adults, maybe more. They have a white van. This is all on the first sheet. The section below this has been ripped out. This is from the second sheet. The section above has been ripped out. I have no idea why it has become like this. If you are reading this, then I am probably already dead. Though you may or may not find my body. You who are reading this, please uncover the truth. That is my only desire. Keiji Maibara. His poor parents who have to deal with his death. And the poor parents of Mion and Rena. There we go! Chapter 1 finally complete after a mere, like, 7 hours. A new scenario has been unlocked. All cast reviews started has become available to play at Select Extra. Yeah, I'm not doing that. This is very long. Wow. Yeah, thanks for the congratulations. Please uncover the truth achievement. So, yeah. So, Chapter 1 definitely ends in a cliffhanger, 100%.
If we want to learn the answers, we have to play Chapter 2. Wow, I I don't know what to think of this. That whole thing was a mind screw at the end. I don't know what was actually real. Keiji was clearly going insane. I don't know how he died. I, I don't know what the heck was up with Mion and Rena. So much stuff was unresolved, but makes sense. There are a bunch of ch different chapters. All right, well... I don't really know how to process this. It is extraordinarily late. I am very, very tired. I need to end the stream here. Thank you all for joining in. We will be streaming Backyard Baseball on Wednesday, and a new stream series will start up on the weekend. I hope you guys have a fantastic rest of your night, and God bless.